Good morning, good morning, ladies. You may have seen these cute flyers in the back, and I'm sure your leaders told you last week, um, we have our women's summer series coming up. Summer is coming quickly, I know, it's crazy. But uh, June 14th and June or July 12th, we will be having um, an event here. It's Tuesday night, so that's a little weird for you ladies. I told the Tuesday night ladies, I'm like, y'all have one up, that's normal to you. But for Thursday morning ladies, it's a little different. But we wanted to um, get these out to you. We have Kate Merrick coming on June 14th. We have Sheila joining us on July 12th. And um, we're super excited about it. We're going to have fellowship in the courtyard. It's going to be kind of like mini conferences. So like conferences broken up into two days so you can bring a friend and you can just enjoy an evening together. We want to encourage you, start grabbing the flyers in the back. In the bookstore, we have some also. Start passing them out. Start inviting ladies. Pray for who the Lord would have you invite. The gospel message is going to go out. As you know, that's a passion of our church. And so we we want the gospel to go out. We want to see this um, high desert changed by the gospel. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of that and to um, just start passing out flyers, inviting people. Be the ride. You know, like, I'll take you. We'll all go. It'll be fun. Do that. Girls Day, you know. So um, it starts at 6.30 p.m., and it'll run until about 8.30, 9 o'clock, okay? So be looking for more information on that, but you can pick up some flyers in the back. And with that, let's go ahead and let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you that we have made it here this morning. Lord, I thank you that your mercies are new every morning. I thank you that you are as faithful as the sunrise and the sunset, Lord. You are so good. Lord, we thank you for being in this place with us, Lord, that you desire to meet us here, that you desire to speak to each one of us, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for the joy that it is to study your word. We thank you that we are blessed and privileged to hold it in each one of our laps, Lord, whether it be in a digital way or if it's physical, but Lord, we have so much access to your word. And Lord, help us to never, ever take that for granted, Lord, but that we would cherish it, that we would be thankful for it. Lord, I pray that as we study Hosea, as we continue on this path, Lord, I pray that you would just um, continue to, to meet us where we're at, Lord, I thank you that you are able to speak to each one of us individually, and so I pray that you would do that today. Lord, I pray for any distractions that may be consuming our mind. Lord, any burdens that we carry in here. Lord, I thank you that you are so faithful to say, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would lay them at your feet and that we would just leave them there because you can deal with them and you can handle it, Lord. And there's so often times that we try and do it on our own, but Lord, we can't do it in our own power. And so, Lord, I pray that we would just rest in you. Lord, I pray that you would just go before our time now, that you would just speak, that you would just minister. And we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to share with you something about myself that you may judge me afterwards, and that's okay. I am a control freak, and so when we go anywhere, if it's not my husband driving and it's not my dad driving, I have to drive. It's like, no, no, I'm going to drive. I don't know if it it is that control thing or if I actually just like driving that much. I'm not sure, but I feel the need to be behind the wheel. I'm always like, no, it's fine. I'll drive. I'll take my car. It's fine. We'll load it full of people. So we were going down to a pastor's um, wife's, uh, it, was, it was like a brunch, is that what it is? Like, a luncheon, that's what they call it, a luncheon. Very fancy, you know, a luncheon. And so we had gone down, it was in San Juan Capistrano, so we went down the night before to spend the night, all the pastor's wives, and we were driving to get, I think we were driving to get dessert that night, and so we were by, we're in San Juan, there's not a ton of places to stay, so we were closer to the ocean, but like where restaurants are still open was further inland, right? And so I'm like, I'll drive, get in my car, we're going to get food. So we got in the car, and we are driving, and I have 
my GPS, my navigation on my phone, right? Because I don't know where I'm at. I don't really know the area. It's on my phone. And so I'm sitting there and I'm kind of watching my phone, but I'm also trying to half listen to the conversation that's going on in the car. So I'm not fully paying attention and I miss my little like split, you know, like where I was supposed to go that way, I went that way. And I was like, oh man, I missed the split. Like that's such a, okay, how did I miss that? I don't know what happened. And like we're going back and forth. My mom goes, don't you feel the ocean? I said, it's dark. I said, no, mom, I don't feel the ocean. And she goes, you don't? And I'm like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, the ocean is, she actually gave directions and I can't even see ocean. What is it? West. She goes, the ocean is west, and then you're going, what, I think I was going south or something. I don't even know. See, I don't know. And my mom was like, you can't feel the ocean? And I'm like, no, Moana, I can't feel the ocean. I was like, what do you mean? And so I'm sitting here, and I'm, we, we laugh. I mean, this was years ago. We still laugh about it. But I lived in the history of MapQuest. You guys remember MapQuest where you had to like pull up and print out the directions? That was the history and GPS where it's on your phone or it's on your little device. I think my dad had like the Magellan. You always had something to tell you where you needed to go, right? My mom lived in the history of actual maps. And I, yeah, I was gonna say, y'all remember the actual maps. And clearly she lived in the history of never eat shredded wheat, right? <laughs> She knew, she knew her north, east, south, and west. Our history dictated our present, but it also dictated and guided our future. History is important. We forget or neglect history, and we are not taking our, care of our present nor our future. When we look at U.S. history, we can not only see how far we have come as a nation, but we can see our setbacks, we can see our failures, and we can strive to prevent them in the future. When we take a look at world history, we can see a much broader perspective. We can see the rise and the fall of civilizations. We can see corrupt leaders and what that impact had on a nation. We can see those who stood for what was right and how that changed the course. We can even see the history of the Bible and Christians' impact on the world, can we not? But what about your history? What do you see when you look back at your past, your victories, your failures, and your shortcomings? Think about it. How has your childhood shaped you? When did you accept Christ? When did you really surrender to Christ? Because those can be two very different seasons, right? When did you fail, but he showed himself faithful? And what does that all mean for you today in your present and in your future? You see, ladies, I think we so often want to forget our history. Well, at least we want to forget the bad. We want to push it aside and we want to pretend like it never happened. I don't love to remember my failures or my moments of sin. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we should dwell or live in our past. That's very, very different. We know that in Christ, all things are a new creation, right? Right? But what I am suggesting is that we don't forget where we came from, and we also use it as markers in the road of life to let you know where you're going. We find ourselves in Hosea 12. We have both Judah and Ephraim in a downward spiral. Now, from what we've studied before, we know that Judah tends to kind of be a little bit behind Ephraim in the sin pattern because they've had these godly kings that have been raised up. Because Ephraim and Judah are two different nations. They have two different kings. And because of that, even though they're all Israel, Judah has had some godly kings that have stepped up and kind of put them back on the right track. But in this moment, in this place, we find them both kind of spinning downward in a, in a way that my dad used to say, you better check yourselves before you wreck yourselves, right? That's what the Lord is saying right here to Ephraim and to, Judea, to Judah. In this section of scripture, we're going to use Jacob's life as a bit of an outline. We're going to see how the Lord used his life and his history as a map for the Israelites to see where they came from, where they found themselves, and hopefully a pivot point for them that could really change everything. Look at verse 2 in Hosea 12. It says, The Lord has an indictment against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. He will repay him according to his deeds. 
In the womb, he took his brother by the heel, and in manhood, he strove with God. There's a common denominator, no matter how far they are in their sin pattern, there's a common denominator between both Ephraim and Judah, and we have mention of it here, and it's Jacob. You see, he levels out the playing field for both of them because they're all descendants of Jacob, and they would all be acquainted with Jacob and his story. It's something that they would have heard since birth because it is their history. Just like we've heard about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, they knew about Jacob. When God's promises began to be fulfilled and seen, it started with Jacob. Yes, he gave promises to Abraham. Yes, he gave promises to Isaac. But you really started to see that promise develop in Jacob. Look back at Genesis 15, and you'll see the Lord speaking to Abraham. And he says, he brought him outside, and he said, look towards the heaven and number the stars, if you're able to number them. And then he said to them, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted to him his righteousness. But we know from what we've seen in the Bible that Sarah, his wife, with, with Abraham, they only had one promised son, right? And that promised son was Isaac. It doesn't seem quite like offspring as numerous as the stars at this moment, does it? But God promised, and we know that God is faithful to keep his promises. So now we have Isaac, the promised son, and Isaac has how many sons? Two. You guys can respond. Two. Okay. And it's Jacob and Esau. And now we're introduced into our leading character here in our history lesson. Our introduction to these two men comes in Genesis 25, 22, where it says this, the children struggled together within her, speaking of their mother, Rebecca, and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. And when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. Could you imagine? Behold, there's twins. Oh, my goodness. When her day, the first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they named him Esau. That's encouraging. Like, yeah, we're going to name this one Harry. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. First off. I just want to take a minute, and I want to enter this document to the court as evidence article num number 1,862 of the fact that siblings just fight. <laughs> Ladies, this should encourage us that we are not failing as parents, or maybe this was just a word for me, just because your kids fight, okay? Rebecca hadn't even had a chance to hold these boys in her arms yet, and they were already wrestling. And when she asks the Lord, as we so often do when our kids are fighting and going crazy, we say, what in the world is happening? And the Lord just calmly states, oh, yeah, by the way, two nations are in there. You're like, oh, cool. Thanks for letting me know, Lord. Two nations. Great. And does he tell her, don't worry. They'll be fine. They'll live in peace. They just don't have enough room in there. No, no, no. The Lord tells her something extremely controversial for the time. It's actually downright unheard of. The older shall serve the younger. You see, right here in this moment, I now want you to jump back to Hosea. And I want you to see what the history has to teach. I know I threw you off right there. You forgot for a second we were in the book of Hosea, but follow me here. The older is serving the younger. It was not a common practice in the Old Testament. Age and birth order determined your importance, your status, and even your inheritance. But the Lord here, before Jacob even goes about any of his deceiving or manipulating, because we know that's in his history, right? And we'll get there. But God declares that Jacob will be served by Esau. The blessing is with him. Now look at Israel, or Judah, Judah and Ephraim as stated here. How did they start out? Do you remember the land that they're in? It was the land that was given to them as an inheritance by the Lord through the promise God made to his people. Was it anything that they deserved? Absolutely not. They ended up with some setbacks because they had really bad attitudes along the way, right? But God was faithful to himself and he delivered on his promises. But what did Jacob do and what was Israel currently doing? 
They were taking matters into their own hands. Look at Jacob first. He comes out and he's grabbing at his brother's heel, right? We have that reference in Genesis, and then Hosea makes a mention of it again. And I feel like there must have been something distinct about the way they were gra- that he was grabbing it because they gave him the name Jacob, which means heel catcher or supplanter. And I don't know if you guys know what that means. I didn't know what that means. It means to overthrow by tripping up. And so we know that they're being very literal here, right? Because we, we talked about Esau, he's hairy, so they named him the hairy one, basically. That's what Esau means. And then they go, okay, very literal here, Jacob, the dude's grabbing at his brother's heel. And it wasn't just like, oh, look, that's so cute. They want to hold each other. It was like, no, this was intense. This is like enough where they're saying, this dude is a heel catcher. That was not a nice thing to say about someone. We also know that from Genesis that Jacob took advantage of his brother's hunger, right? And he convinced Esau to give up his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. Now, ladies, I don't even care if you are vegan and you love lentil soup. I promise you that if you had an inheritance or birthright, you are not going like, yep, you know what? I'm going to give that all up for this bowl of lentil soup. Like, Jacob must have been a really good cook. That's all I'm saying. And then with the assistance of his mother, we find Jacob also deceiving his blind and dying father and saying he's his brother Esau and receiving the blessing. So the birthright was very different than the blessing. And and Jacob took both of them by deceit and by by, um, taking advantage of Esau. Jacob took everything from him. Hosea is reminding Israel of all these things, and Hosea is saying, look at the past. Look at your history. You are doing the exact same thing. How? Let's go back to Hosea eleven twelve, 12, and what does it say? It says, Ephraim has surrounded me with lies. And the house of Israel, that's both of them together, the united thing of Israel, right? This is Ephraim and Judah the house of Israel with deceit. Now, again, we have this brief glimpse of a possible redemptive moment for Judah, but Judah still walks with God and is faithful in the Holy One. But remember, we went in verse 2 of chapter 12, and almost immediately after, what is it? Judah, God has a problem with Judah. So we know that this moment of repentance or this moment of right living did not last long. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind all day long. They multiply falsehoods and violence. They make a covenant with Assyria, and oil is carried to Egypt. You see, Israel has found itself no longer entrusting in God's word, but taking matters into its own hands. Look at this. They deceive both Egypt and Assyria, trying to make allies on both sides with their enemies and their enemies' enemies. So understand, this is not going to end well. Like, you don't make allies with all the enemies. And they went behind Egypt's back and made an ally pact with Assyria. And they went behind Assyria's back and made an ally pact with Egypt. This is not safe. This is not a good idea. And then look at verses 7 and 8 in Hosea 12. What does it say? It says, a merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress. Ephraim has said, ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself and all my labors. They cannot find in me iniquity or sin. They are lying and manipulating the people for their own gain, stealing to place themselves in better standing, not caring for anyone who was struggling or without. Does that not sound like what Jacob did to Esau about Jacob taking advantage of his brother in his hunger and his father in his death? Israel also mocks the prophets of God, claiming they're crazy when their words are are the very words of God. That's how they were justifying their sin. Look at verse 10. It says, I spoke to the prophets. This is the Lord speaking. Let me clear something up really quick because I keep saying Hosea says, and it's not Hosea himself. These are the words of the Lord. And throughout all of Hosea 12, it is directly the words of the Lord. And and, um, the Lord is saying, I spoke to the prophets. It was I who multiplied the visions and through the prophets gave parables. God has to remind them that he was the one giving the visions and the dreams and words to the prophets. They're trying to justify their sin 
Um, because the prophets are calling them out on their sin, right? We see Hosea all through Hosea. He's calling them out on their sin. And there are other prophets within the area that God is using and speaking through at the same time, calling the Israelites out on their sin. And, and they're saying, the way they're justifying their sin is they're saying, these people are crazy. Oh, they're crazy. We don't have to listen to them. Do we not hear that nowadays? Like, oh, that Bible, that's crazy. No, that's the word of God. And that is what the Lord is telling them here. This sounds much like the history of their ancestor, Jacob. I want you to remember Jacob in Genesis 28. He had a dream, and and in that dream, he has a vision of God. And it says, and he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. And behold, the angel of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread, out, uh, spread abroad to the west and the east and to the north and the south. And in you and your offspring shall, be all, the families, uh, or shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised. And immediately in the moment, Jacob responds by saying, Surely the Lord is in this place. He even says, This place is awesome. But as soon as he wakes up in the morning, he responds with a different tone. He responds with if. Jacob then made a vow saying, If God will be with me. And will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may come to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. Jacob is doubting the very promises God just made him. He literally was woke up and he was like, that was amazing. That was awesome. This place. And he even calls the place Bethel, which is the Lord is here. This is the Lord's place. And he's saying, this place is the Lord's place. And then within what? Maybe a couple hours at most, he wakes up and he's like, well, if the Lord, if God's going to do this, then I'll do my part. He's saying to God, you do your part and I'll do mine. He's doubting the promises of God. And he's not just doubting the promises that God made to him. Remember, God even said to him in this moment, I made these promises to your father. I've made these promises to your grandfather. And I'm making them again specifically to you. And and, uh, Jacob's kind of like, okay, sure you are. We'll see what happens. And now here we are with Israel, just like Jacob, forgetting God's promises. They're doubting his provision, trying to take advantage of people, manipulating the money, and they're ignoring his word. We know the story of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel, and how God met his match, or God, Jacob met his match of deceit and manipulation in his uncle Laban, did he not? But we also know that uh, Jacob was finally being a, a man of his word, right? He starts to work for seven years for his bride. Then he gets tricked and deceived. He's got to work another seven years, so a total of 14 years. And the Lord was with him, and he made him very profitable. The Lord is delivering on his promises because God is faithful even when we are not. Because even though Jacob wasn't the most faithful to God, he still was there with him. He still was meeting him where he's at. It is who he is. Our God is a faithful God. He cannot, he cannot withhold his faithfulness even from himself. It doesn't matter how faithful we are. He is faithful. And in Genesis 31.3, God reminds Jacob yet again that he is with him. He says, then the Lord says to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers, to your kindred. And again, he says, I will be with you. After a whole lot of drama between him and his father-in-law, Jacob finally sets out to return to his homeland. But remember what he had done. His father and mother are are believed to be um, gone at this point. Um, and he had lied and manipulated and stole and cheated his brother, and then he ran. And now, as he kind of travels home, that reality of like, oh, I have to face the music, because he messed up, right? He messed up big time, and he becomes fearful. So what does Jacob do? Does he turn to the Lord, and he repent and accept his consequences for his actions and seek forgiveness? Well, Maybe kind of not really. 
Because Jacob begins to send all sorts of things to his brother to try and change the situation, right? He goes through and he says, maybe a bribe, kind of saying, oh, look, this is, look what I'm willing to give you. I have all this stuff. Let me give it to you. Don't hurt me. But look, I have things for you. How fun. Yay. And he sends that stuff to his brother, right? And through his deeds and his actions, he tries to make amends. Then he sends his servants and his family. It's kind of like he's trying to redeem himself. Like, look, I have people who love me. Don't kill me. You know, that kind of thing. But Jacob has yet to surrender and trust God's promises. God said what? I will be with you. And Jacob's like, yeah, I don't know about that, Lord. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try and do this in my own power. Still, Jacob's efforts are all worthless without a heart change. Here we find Israel doing the same thing. They're adding Yahweh to their mix. Remember, we've heard that over and over again. They're taking the God of their father, of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, and they're taking this God that they know, their covenant God, and they're throwing it in the mix with the idols. And they're saying, yeah, 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 I'll cover that base too, right? Kind of like Jacob sending all the gifts over. Like, I'll just try everything. I'll throw everything at it. That's what they're doing. And I know that we've said, and even it's clear in the scripture, that this is like leaving your spouse for another, kind of like that prostitution that we saw with Hosea and his wife Gomer. But this is not, I think it is that, but there's also another aspect to it that I think is kind of like grouping your spouse in with multiple people as you're dating. Like you're dating all these people and your spouse and you're like, hey, let's all hang out. This is a good time. Let's, I'll buy you all dinner. I'll buy you all, let's, let's all go out to dinner. That's like crazy. That's like blasphemous. That's what they're doing. They're literally blaspheming the name of God by taking him and putting him in the same category with these stones and these idols and these rocks. In Hosea 12, 11, it says, their iniquity, um, if there is iniquity in Gilead, they shall surely come to nothing in Gilgal. The, uh, the sacrifice of the bulls, their altars are also like stone heaps on the furrows of the field. You see, Gilgal and Gil Gilead, these are the epicenters of social and religious, religious practices, and they are full of corruption. Their places of worship are worthless piles of rock. The altars they were sacrificing on were like a stone heap in the middle of a plowing field. It's only getting in the way. You can't plow through a field with a stone heap, right? You can't plant. You can't, you can't glean when you've got these stone heaps in the way. And that's what he's saying. He's saying it's worthless. Move your stones out of the way. They're not doing anything. Just like the pillar Jacob sets up for the Lord and he anoints it with oil. And then he says, if... It's all worthless because it's not about the altar, but about the heart behind the sacrifice. Now, here is our pivot point in Jacob's life. The same night he arose and he took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Um, he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip, hip socket. And Jacob's hip was, hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and men and, and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And there he blessed him. You see, Jacob was all alone. And once again, we find the Lord revealing himself to Jacob. As Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, at first Jacob prevailed, but the angel touched his hip so that it was damaged in some way. Now Jacob, at the true point of surrender, cried out for a blessing, and he was blessed. He was now changed. As a symbol of that surrender and a resulting blessing, the messenger changed his name. Before it had been heel grasper, cheat, supplanter, but now it became Israel, which meant one who had struggled with God and been overcome. Jacob had to risk losing it all to receive what God had for him. 
Remember, he had taken all of his wealth and everything that he had accumulated through his cheating and lying and deceiving, and he had sent it all across to Esau, not knowing what would become of it. He could lose all his wealth, his family, his servants, everything, but that's not what mattered the most. Jacob found himself wrestling with this messenger, and then and only then did he truly meet God. I like what Ironside says about this. He says, when they were unable to, uh, they were unable longer to struggle, he clung to him against whom he had striven. And this was the power with which he prevailed when he wept and made supplication to him. Jacob did not gain victory by what he had. He didn't gain victory by his strength, but solely by his weakness. As he cries out to God, pouring out his soul, he prevails. In 2 Corinthians, we know it speaks of this truth. It says, but he says to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And then you jump down to verse 10. It says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is what the Lord is now telling Israel. This is the history that he wants them to remember. Right here in this moment, this can be their pivot point and it can change their future. He says he will bring them to nothing. Remember Hosea 12 verse 9 says, I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. This appointed feast that they're talking about is the Feast of Tabernacles where they would go out into their tents, kind of remember the time that they were in the wilderness, remember the time that they had nothing, remember the time that they were fully reliant on the Lord. And that's why God wants to say, I will bring you back to this moment. He wants to take them back to the place where their reliance was on the Lord and on him alone. Remember, they wandered the desert and they had no place to call home there. They had only the clothes on their back. They had manna from heaven that the Lord was providing for them. And it was just enough to get through each and every day. He provided water. He provided the guidance through the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And he provided protection and covering from the sun in the day with that same cloud and the warming up of the cold desert night with that fire. When Israel was sent into Canaan under Joshua, she was given the task of rooting out the corruption and establishing a culture that was marked by holiness instead. Israel's task was to make Canaan Israel. But what has happened? Canaan made Israel Canaan. Like the breaking of Jacob, God desires to break the Israelites. And it's not out of anger or even out of legality, not even out of the fact that he's looking and saying, hey, look, you broke my laws. You're, you're not being faithful, but out of love for his people. That is his desire. That's always his desire. It's to bring them back. God is in a current wrestling match with his people. He's doing everything they can, he can to bring them to a place of surrender, to bring them to a place of brokenness. Because then and only then can they meet God. Look back at Hosea 12.3. It reminds us of that time that, he, uh, that Jacob met God at Bethel and there God spoke with us. The Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial name. So you, by the help of your God, return and hold fast to love and justice and wait continually for your God. You see what happens in our brokenness and our surrender? We meet God and he speaks with us. God takes this moment in the life of Jacob to remind the Israelites some 1,200 years later that he is the God who keeps his promises to his people, that he remembers what he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he is faithful to keep those promises. He says, I am the God of that memorial name. He is the God of the covenant. These idols that they were worshiping, what they had surrendered to, could do nothing for them. Hosea 12, 14 says, Ephraim has given bitter provocation. So the Lord will leave, his, uh, so his Lord will leave his blood guilt on him and will repay him for his dis disgraceful deeds. His Lord. We're speaking of Ephraim's Lord. Remember, this is not the Lord of the covenant. That word for Lord there is not the word for Yahweh. That is just gods. That's all the gods that Ephraim is serving. And uh, what does it do for them? What do these gods do for them? It leaves them guilty. And they will receive the punishment for their guilt. This is an end with no hope. To continue in sin in the way they were going, they would be hopeless, guilty, and as good as dead. But not with Yahweh. 
There is hope in our God. Look at verse 6. It says, so you, by the help of your God, your God, return, hold fast to love and justice, and wait continually for your God. He doesn't leave us dead in our sins, but with his help, he brings us to return to him. We can't do it on our own. We need his bloodshed. We need his redemption. We need the help of our God because only by his bloodshed, only by the bloodshed of our innocent Jesus, are we declared guiltless. So what do we do with all of this? I want you to notice three things. God's promises does not need man's intervention. He only needs obedience. Jacob's sinful nature wasn't justified because of the promise. The blessing was with him from the beginning. God would have worked things out his way and with fewer consequences for Jacob if he would have properly recognized his sin and trusted God with the process. Ladies, God has given us all promises in his word that we should be living out daily in our lives. We should in turn be walking in obedience and we need to trust him every step of the way. Trust the process. He sees the big picture we see here. And it is very hard for our finite minds to understand what God has planned. Trust him, trust his word, walk in his promises. Our history is forgiven, but it should never be forgotten and should be guidelines that keep us going in the ways of the Lord. God is clearly taking the history of Jacob, both good and bad, and using it to guide his people in their current state. We see this all throughout the Bible, right? The Bible is full of stories, good, bad, ugly, all of it, for us to look at and learn from. God doesn't want the history to be forgotten. There's good things that come from our history. We can look back and we can see all that God has done in our lives and what he has brought us through. But we can also use the bad in our history as a reference point like the Lord did um, here with the Israelites. I'm going to illustrate this with another driving reference, because remember, I like to drive. So the lane markers are more than just things that show us where we are, right? We learn that in driver's ed. When you're doing your behind the wheel, they tell you, look at the lane markers ahead, right? You're not supposed to look down. You're not supposed to look. You're supposed to kind of look at the lane markers that just right ahead of you and keep those in your way, because that's where you need to stay. That's where you need to aim. That's where you need to go. And just when you start to veer off of those things, what do you get? My mom calls it driving braille, okay? You get that thump, 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 right? And that thump, 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 thump warns you that you are not where you intended to be. This should be how we use history that we aren't the most proud of, the moments where we lived in our own way and tried to make things happen in our sinful nature. They should be that thump, 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 thump that remind us when we're starting to veer off course, not so that we can continue in it. We don't want to go, woohoo, I like driving Braille. This is fun. No, it's to draw us back into the right lane so that we can quickly correct and we can quickly do, and we don't cause any issues, right? We don't cause an accident. We don't want to cause an accident. That's what this is doing for us. That's what our, our bad history should be for us. God's love goes deeper than our past. It saturates our present and it plans out our future. I need you to rest in that. God wasn't calling the Israelites out on their sin to shame them. He wasn't using Jacob's history to mock them or to mock Jacob and throw it in Jacob's face. He was calling them out to change them. God and his love had a plan, and it was always, always, always a plan of redemption. The Bible shows us that God is never surprised or caught off guard by our human attempts at justification or lack thereof. From the creation of the world, from Genesis, from, the, from before he even spoke it into existence, his plan was redemption for us. Let this navigate your heart today. And ladies, can I challenge you? If God can use the history of Jacob to impact the people in Hosea's time, he can use your history to impact those around you. Don't be afraid to share where you've come from. We all have redemptive stories because we're all sinners saved and loved by a very gracious God. Don't be afraid to share where you've come from because it is not your present. 
Where you have come from is not who you are today because you have been saved and redeemed. And it's for sure not where you're going. So don't be afraid to share that history because Jesus took all of your shame, all of that sin was nailed to the cross and he took it for you. And so you know what? Let it go and let it be your testimony. Let it declare his goodness. Let it declare his faithfulness and let it declare what a loving and awesome and faithful God you serve. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you're a God who can use our history. What a blessing that is. Lord, you can make beauty from ashes. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we pray that we would just trust you, that we would walk in obedience with you, that we would trust the process that you're taking us through. Lord, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But God, you are faithful. Let us trust your faithfulness. Let us trust your promises. Let us not get in the way. Lord, I pray that we would just surrender to you. Lord, I ask that you would just um, be with this group time. Lord, let us continue to grow um, and just grow in you. Let us walk away better believers, better followers of Jesus. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.